subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update. Join the only official Telegram channel of Rao's IA Study Circle to get relevant material and important updates. Hello everyone and welcome to Daily News Simplified, your one-stop solution to detailed analysis of daily current affairs published in the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper. Articles dated 13th of June 2021, which are put up for today's discussion are on your screen. And the time stamping for the same is given in the description box. So let us begin with the first article itself. So first article for today's discussion is related to the Olive Ridley Turtles. And this article is titled as Operation Olivia to Rescue Olive Ridley. This was published on page 1 of the Hindu newspaper Delhi edition. From exam point of view, this article is important for your prelims examination on environmental issues and current affairs. For means, it is important for your general studies paper 3. Operation Olivia is conducted by Indian Coast Guard. Yes, this force is also responsible for providing the overall national security to the coastal areas of India. This operation is functioning since 1980 and the objective of this operation is to protect the olive ridley turtles off the coast of Odisha. It also focuses on protecting the nesting places which is also known as Aribadas on the coast of Odisha. Odisha Marine Fisheries Act also empowers the Indian Coast Guard as one of the enforcement agencies. It means Indian Coast Guard can also implement rules regulations on the coastal areas in order to protect the olive ridley species which are coming to these coastal areas for nesting purposes. Olive ridley turtles, it is a vulnerable species under the IUCN red list. The scientific name is Lepidocele olivacea. It is under the Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act 1972 and it is part of Appendix 1 under Sites. The important term in the article was Aribada which means mass nesting of such turtles. When it comes to mating and giving eggs, they prefer a peaceful and sand-led coastal areas. And this is the reason why they come in the month of November to December to the coastal areas of Odisha. There are three Aribadas which are very famous. They include Gahir Batta, Mouth of Devi River and Rushikulia. Apart from that, there are smaller areas in the Hope Islands and Ashtaranga coast in the coastal areas of Orissa where they are also found. When it comes to the threat to the olive ridley turtles, it includes heavy predation of the eggs by dogs in the wild animals because they feed on those eggs indiscriminate fishing with trawlers and gill nets. It also includes beach soil erosion, pet trading in the international markets as well as infrastructure development since the coming of new CRZ rules. However, in order to protect this species, following measures are required and have also been taken up. This include use of turtle excluder devices prohibiting the use of gill nets on turtle approaches to the shore, curtailing the turtle approaching and periodic patrolling by the forces, mass awareness and declaring no man's land. It means that no human interference should be allowed in those areas where nesting or hatching activity is taking place. When it comes to the important areas where olive ridley turtles are concerned, it includes your eastern coast of Odisha, including Gahir Matha, mouth of Devi River and Rushikulia. You have to remember these things in north to south or south to north direction. Apart from these, there are other important map work which you should keep in mind. It includes your Chilika Lake, which is a lagoon, Puri town, which is also important for your medieval history, Chandipur beach which has already been asked by the UPSC and of course your rivers like Baitarni, Bahamani, Mahanadi, Rushikulia and Subar Rekha. On the right of your screen you can see that these are the newly hatched olive ridley babies and on the bottom side you can see the adult member of a olive ridley turtle species. The important difference between the turtle and the toy toys is listed on your screen. These are the major differences. 
The first difference is that turtles are aquatic and they prefer marine form of climate. On the other side, tortoise are semi-terrestrial and they prefer fresh water foam. Turtles are comparatively smaller in size. On the other hand, tortoise have larger size. Turtles have heart-shaped carapace. On the other side, tortoise have ovoid carapace shape. Fore and the hind limbs are modified into pedals among turtles. This helps them to swim in the water. Fore and the head limbs are not modified into pedals and they look like a feet among tortoise. When it comes to the head of the turtle, it is partially withdrawn into the shell. On the other hand, tortoise have completely withdrawn onto the shell. Some turtles are flesh eaters also. On the other hand, tortoise are herbivores. They feed almost or entirely on the vegetation available on their locality. With this, now we move to the important question for this article, which is listed on your screen. Read the question carefully and answer it. We now move to the next article for the day. This article was published on page 6 of the Hindu newspaper Delhi edition. This article actually dealing with an important biodiversity topic that is the important flora and fauna in India. This topic is important for your GS paper 1 as well as GS paper 3 in the mains examination as well as important for your prelims perspective from the side of current affairs. This article is actually talking about an important floral species which is known as rosewood tree. The context of the article says that illegal felling of the centuries-old rosewood trees was observed in the district of Vayanad. Because of this, the environmental organization, including the NGOs in the district, have sought an investigation from the Invigilance Wing of the Police Department or the Central Bureau of Investigation under the supervision of the respective High Court. However, Going by this demand, the state government has set up a special investigation team or the SIT to probe the incident of felling of these trees. But the importance of the article comes from the relevance of the rosewood species. This species has a scientific name of Dolbergia latifolia. It has its origin in the India itself. That means it is an indigenous tree. It is located right from the sub-Himalayan tracts of the eastern Uttar Pradesh up to Sikkim and it is also found in central, western and including the southern India where this topic was in the news. The climatic condition of this tree is very wide. It can survive up to 50 degrees of high temperature and it can also survive with a minimum of 0 degrees. Such a high range of temperature makes it very diverse and regionally located. The annual rainfall required by this tree is from 75 cm to the 500 cm. It means the tree can be found in the different kind of vegetation right from your moist deciduous to the evergreen forest. The special feature of this tree is that it can survive or it can withstand moderate to low forest fires. That means the survival of this species even under the natural disaster is high. When it comes to the uses of this species, well, it is a hard wood. It is close grained and very strong. It is durable and it is also used for the ornamental purposes. It is used for large number of purposes, including your furniture, paneling, ornamental works, ordinance works, agriculture implements and others. This tree is also used for export to the foreign countries, including Europe, under the name Rosewood or Bombay Blackwood. So UPSC can also ask with the name Bombay Blackwood. Earlier times or even today, this tree was used for making cartwheels, gun carriages. That means this tree has multiple uses. And because of these uses, the deforestation or the higher cutting down of this tree or the felling of this tree has become a matter of concern from the perspective of environment. Now this is the question which is attached to the article. Read the question carefully and answer it. With this now we move to the next article for the day. This article was published on page 12 of the Hindu newspaper Delhi edition and it deals with the issue of bitcoins. Recently, 
A nation in the Latin America, El Salvador, has become the world's first country to implement the cryptocurrency as a legal tender. It means the cryptocurrency will enjoy the same authority as the current or the contemporary currency of El Salvador is enjoying. Now, cryptocurrency in this country can be used for a number of purposes including payment of taxes, freely convertible to the other currencies and payment for goods and services. If you are a person who is living in El Salvador, you can easily buy goods and services from the market, pay your taxes through the use of cryptocurrency bitcoins. However, as far as India is concerned, we have a very brief history of what cryptocurrency in India is and how it is actually being practiced. Well, in India, cryptocurrency is not illegal to trade. It means if you are trading in cryptocurrency, government cannot impose any penalty on you. However, at the same time, there is no regulatory framework in India to control the use and trading of cryptocurrency. Many of the private exchanges which are dealing in the cryptocurrency are already working in India. For example, the Wazir X. It deals in trading that is buying and selling of cryptocurrency in India. However, when it comes to the government's stand on the cryptocurrency, we will observe that it is yet evolving. Take for instance, in 2018, RBI has issued a circular to all the financial institutions including banks to not provide services or the entities which are dealing in the virtual currencies. The term used by the RBI was virtual currencies. However, after this circulation, government actually constituted a separate committee under Subhash Chandra Garg and this committee recommended a ban on the private cryptocurrencies. The committee says that there are concerns such as volatility, instability, security risk and risk of funding illegal activities attached with the cryptocurrencies. However, this committee also came up with a favor of official digital currency that can be issued by the RBI. In 2020, what happened that there was a case which was going on in the Supreme Court and this case was Internet and Mobile Association of India versus Reserve Bank of India in which Supreme Court has stuck down 2018 circular of RBI. It ruled that RBI's move will actually violate people's fundamental right to carry on any occupation, trade or business under Article 19.1g of the Constitution. Well, the argument of the Supreme Court was simple that whatever people are doing and if it is not generating any illegal activities because when you read the Article 19.2 you will find that all these benefits or all these kind of freedoms have their restrictions attached to them. So, the Supreme Court has ruled that while the RBI has power to regulate virtual currencies, the prohibition imposed through the April 2018 circular is disproportionate and therefore ultra wise the constitution. Recently, in 2021, two important developments already taken place in India. First one was that the RBI has decided to withdraw its 2018 circular after the Supreme Court order. Which means that RBI no longer can restrict the cryptocurrency use in India. And secondly, government has come up to introduce a cryptocurrency and regulation of official digital currency bill 2021, which is likely to be introduced in the coming monsoon session of the parliament. The bill seeks to provide two different avenues. First, it banned all private cryptocurrencies in India as well as it provides for the issuance of official digital currency by RBI on the recommendation of the Subhash Chandra Garg Committee in 2019. Well, what does that mean? It means that in the near future, if this bill becomes an act, Reserve Bank of India would be allowed to provide digital currencies which you and me can use through the digital purposes including your e-wallets, your internet banking and other means. However, you will never ever get those currencies in physical form in your pocket. So those digital currencies will be used only for the digital payments and nothing else. Now, there are many advantages and disadvantages which are attached to the bitcoins and of course the cryptocurrency in general. 
The advantages include the potential of higher returns because the returns attached to the bitcoins are exponential. Protection from payment fraud because it is cryptography which is attached to the mining of this currency. Hence, the payment frauds are negligible. It also includes immediate settlement and international transaction because you do not need any kind of conversion of the currency from one form to the other or from one a denomination to the other, the international payments become instant and easier. And it attached to the diversification with higher liquidity. On the disadvantage side, there are high volatility and the potential of large losses. Because once there is an exponential high in the returns, it may also go into the downward side and can create high losses. It is also likely that it will promote the black market activity because these currencies are not regulated in India by RBI. The next being the unregulated and unbagged and cyber hackings are attached to these kind of payments. And lastly, if you are going through the loss in the cryptocurrency, you are not likely to get refund under any circumstances. So these are the pros and the cons of using cryptocurrency as far as India's economy is concerned. And because of these issues, Government as well as RBI is very skeptical when it comes to the use or regularization of the Bitcoins in India. Now we move to the question attached to this article. Read the question carefully and answer it. With this, now we move to the next article for the day. This article was published on page 14 of the Hindu newspaper Delhi edition and it talks about the recent government initiative to boost up the demand of electric vehicles. Central government recently has made a partial modification of the faster adoption and manufacturing of electric vehicles in India phase 2. In normal parlance, it is also known as FAME 2 program. Government under this initiative has actually increased the subsidy for the electric vehicles by 50% and this will be done under the FAME 2 program. Because of this initiative of the government recently, what we will have that because of the rise in the subsidy, the price would go down and going down of the price will definitely raise the demand of the product. This would also boost the manufacturing sector of India and ultimately would support the Atma Nirbhar Bharat program of Government of India launched last year. And out of all these initiatives, the ultimate goal of the welfareist government or the welfareist governance would be accomplished to provide employment generation and of course the poverty reduction through which India is suffering as of now. The relevance of this article also comes from two different programs which is the National E-Mobility Mission Plan and of course your FAME 1 and FAME 2 scheme. The National E-Mobility Mission Plan was actually launched in 2013 as a national mission to provide the vision and the roadmap for faster adoption of electric vehicles and their manufacturing in India. Under this plan, the government targeted to get at least 6 to 7 million electric vehicles on the road by 2020. Under this plan of 2020, there is an ambitious target to achieve a sale of 6 to 7 millions of hybrid as well as electric vehicles so what government has done, previously what they were doing is to achieve 6 to 7 million of electric vehicles. Now they have added on the hybrid sections of the vehicle into their plan. Hybrid section here means that a vehicle will use two or more sources of energy to run. It may include your conventional fuels like petrol and diesel along with your biofuels or it may also use your electric purposes or finally it may also use other non-conventional sources like hydrogen. So a combination of these would create a hybrid engine and that would be promoted under this plan. When it comes to the difference in the FAME 1 and FAME 2, well the difference is just because of the basic targets under this scheme. The FAME 1 was launched in 2015, FAME 2 in 2019. They are under the same plan and under the same department. However, the focus area is different. In FAME 1, the focus area was to create demand, create technology platform, promote pilot projects and provide charging infrastructure. However, there was a lacking on the fourth criteria of this program. 
government was not able to provide or could not focus more on the charging infrastructure as such. This scheme actually focused on all vehicle segment, right from your two wheelers to the commercial vehicles, including your buses. The biggest change which was observed in the next installment of this program or the next phase of this program was that it focused mostly on the charging infrastructure in which government tried to create a charging station in the area of 3 by 3 square kilometers. This project also focused on providing electric buses to the city transportation, 5 lakh electric three-wheelers, 55,000 electric four-wheeler passenger cars. Indian manufacturers, including Tata and Mahindra, have already been ruling out electric cars in the market. And lastly, this program also focused on 10 lakh electric two-wheelers in the country where India actually is lagging behind than many other developing nations. With this, now we move to the question attached to this article. Now we come to the scheme of the day and the scheme of the day is National Mission on Clean Ganga. Well, this scheme is uh, working as a registered society since 2011. Earlier, this scheme was an implementing arm for National Ganga River Basin Authority, which was created as a statutory body under Environment Protection Act 1986. However, in 2016, this NGRBA was replaced by National Ganga Council. The scheme actually focused on eight states including Uttarakhand, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, West Bengal, Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh, Haryana and Delhi. The program is 100% centrally funded. It means whatever will be spent on the scheme or cleaning of the Ganga and its management will be provided entirely by the central government. The structure of this program is as follows. At the topmost level, there is National Ganga Council under the chairmanship of Honorable Prime Minister of India. Followed by this, there is Empowered Task Force or ETF, which is headed by the Union Minister of Jal Shakti. Under this, we have National Mission for Clean Ganga, which is also the focus for the discussion. Below this, we have respective state Ganga committees and each district from where the river is flowing, we have district Ganga committees. All these institutions are working in synchronization in order to provide the benefits of the program and to provide environmentally sustainable development of River Ganga. Aims and objectives of the schemes are as follows. It provides for effective abatement of pollution and, its, and the rejuvenation of the River Ganga by adopting a river basin approach. It means the entire focus of the scheme would be to provide an effective use of river basin and not the watershed or the peripheral area of the river. It will also focus on promoting the intersectoral coordination for comprehensive planning and management. It means that the government at different level can also take the use or can also bring in the different participants including your urban local bodies and the Panchayati Raj institution. They may also bring other departments and the ministries which include the Ministry of Environment which also includes the Ministry of Urban Development. It also focuses on maintaining the minimum ecological flow in the river Ganga with a aim of ensuring water quality and environmentally sustainable development. The one point which is important here is that Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, which we have already discussed in the previous DNS, will definitely have to bring up the target achievement of National Mission on Clean Ganga or Namami Gange. With this now we move to the last part of today's discussion that is question of the day.